Well, let's bring in Senator Tom Cotton, the incoming senator. Uh, he'll have the GOP conference. He's the third most powerful uh, Republican senator uh, this session, starting January 3rd. Senator, welcome back. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be back on with you. So let me ask you something. Did, did you have any second thoughts about taking a position? How hard was that decision not to take a position within the Trump team? Well, well Brian, anytime you have a chance to, to serve your country by working in a president's cabinet, especially leading our brave men and women and troops, um, it's certainly an attractive opportunity. But um, my wife and I have given it a lot of thought. We read a bunch of memoirs. We talked to a bunch of former cabinet secretaries. It's not a coincidence that not many cabinet secretaries in modern times have young kids, especially preteen kids. Right. Um, it's just a very demanding job. President Trump deserves someone who has devoted 100 percent time and effort to those jobs. Um, and we've made it work with the defense of my Senate schedule. Sometimes that can be tough, but we've made it work. And I just wanted to make sure that I was doing my best to be a good father and a good husband um and i love my work in the senate serving on behalf right. of the people of arkansas working on many of the same issues um that any cabinet secretary would work on but a whole host of other issues across the whole range of issues so um it was the right decision for us and the family and i think it's best for president trump and i look forward you know in my new roles as the chair of the republican conference and chair of the intelligence committee that continue to serve the people of arkansas so um, I was going to bring up, we know the president uh, made decisions, as usual, way too delayed, way too late, to allow the attackums that we delivered way too late to be used uh, to, into Russia territory, where they're actually rocketing the power grid these days and uh, droning the power grid of the Ukrainians. But do you know what they also did? They told the UK, uh, Keir Starmer, not to use his storm shadows, not to allow the Ukrainians to use their storm shadows and leave them restricted, only hitting certain areas within Ukrainian, uh, within Ukraine uh, to attack. So he, again, going halfway. Yeah, it, Brian, as we've discussed before, it, it's half measures that might lead to a full defeat. Um, what the president should have done from the very beginning uh, even before the war started, was making it clear that we would we would back Ukraine and we would help them defend their own territory. This war has now lasted a thousand days when it really should have been over in the first hundred or the first 50 days. If you remember the Ukrainian army with the weapons that Donald Trump started providing them after Barack Obama had refused them, was able to fight off and win uh, against Russian forces the Battle of Kiev. They had a chance to put Russia on the back foot in 2022. They, in fact, took back major parts of the uh, territory in the fall of 2022. But unfortunately, Joe Biden um, has put it around for three years and created a situation on the ground that I think is going to be difficult to reverse entirely. Uh, what we want, what President Trump wants to do, and I think is the right thing to do at this point, is try to help Ukraine um, get to a point where we can have, have a satisfactory ceasefire and then a satisfactory peace deal. I think we have to be clear-eyed, and President Zelensky is, that that's probably not going to result in the reclaiming of all Ukrainian territory lost going back to the Obama administration in 2014. But what it has to do is put Ukraine on a posture in the future from an economic standpoint and a military standpoint that this can never happen again, that there won't be a third invasion of Ukraine under some future Democratic president as we've had under the last two Democratic presidents. But our security guarantees aren't worth anything. In the 90s, we said, if you give up your nukes, we got your back. And they give up their nukes, and we didn't. So why would they believe us now? Yeah, what's what's worth something, Brian, is weapons that can defend your territory and defend your people. And that's what Ukraine didn't have in 2014 when Barack Obama denied it to them. It's what President Trump started to provide to them and allowed them to win that that first battle of Kyiv. And it's what they'll need going forward. Uh, they'll need a, a military that is capable of defending its, their own territory, of protecting their critical infrastructure, of deterring any future um, uh, Russian invasion. Uh, they also need economic growth and development, not just from the battering their economy has taken over the last three years to give their country some prospects for the future, but also to help address um, you know, the budgetary shortfalls, the corruption that was rife in Ukraine before the war. They need to be integrated into Western European uh, economic supply chains so they're no longer dependent on Russia for economic prosperity. Those are the kind of long-term 
solutions that I think will mm-hmm. prevent a war like this from ever happening again. So, uh, Senator, are you okay? I heard the sirens in the background and cars. Are you on the street? Uh, I am on the way to the Capitol right now. Oh. That must have been one of uh, Joe Biden's cabinet secretaries <laughs> going off to what well, will be one of their last days at work. Understood. You're going to have a big vote coming up. We know there's got to be a rapid confirmations, I hope. I, we had uh, Congressman Zinke in here. When he was Secretary of the Interior, he said he never even got a full staff confirmed. He had seven of the 17 nominees. They didn't even hear the rest. I mean, that to me is is bad governance. You can't run a country like that. So we need speed. But the one thing you're going to have is some turbulence. It happens in every cycle. This one with Matt Gates, in particular as Attorney General. Here's what Congressman Jim Himes, a Democrat, said. Cut six. History is a hard, a hard judge, and a, a Republican senator who takes a vote to uh, consent to the appointment of Matt Gates, a chaos agent, a performative social media, no respect for the rule of law individual. The Republican senator who votes to confirm Matt Gates, or Robert Kennedy, or Tulsi Gabbard, yeah. um, will be remembered by history as somebody who completely gave up their uh, yeah. responsibility to uh, to Donald Trump. Your reaction, how history will look at you and your vote, according to Jim Himes. Well, well, I don't remember him being um, on the fainting couch whenever Bro- or Joe Biden chose a cross-dressing luggage thief uh, to be in charge of sensitive nuclear programs at the Department of Energy. And he doesn't, as a Democratic House member, he doesn't have a vote on any of these matters. Look, on all these nominees, uh, we're going to process them promptly and efficiently. They're already starting to make phone calls to senators, to have office calls complete their paperwork, submit that in. When we're sworn in on January 3rd to the new Senate, we have 17 days before President Trump is inaugurated. I expect that our committees will begin to hold confirmation hearings, just as we did eight years ago in that 17-day period. And then when President Trump takes his hand off the Bible and gives a speech, he's going to walk into the Capitol on January 20th and sign uh, those nomination papers, and we'll start processing those immediately. And, and I don't think we should stop until we've largely completed the job. Um, it's not going to be like it was in 2017, and the Democrats dug in their heels and only allowed two confirmations on the inauguration day. I think we should look back to say what happened with Barack Obama in 2009 when he got nine uh, cabinet nominees confirmed in the first 48 hours. That, that should be the floor for us. And if the Democrats want to do it the hard way and stay on the floor and you know, speak for 30 hours on every one of these nominee- nominees until the time runs out and it's time to vote, then that's what we'll just have to do. But uh, after time, uh, I think they'll get the picture that we mean business, that we're going to put the, cap- the president's cabinet in place and allow them to get to work on his agenda. So do you think if, uh, if Donald Trump nominates him, is that good enough for Senator Tom Cotton? Well, certainly as a Republican president, I'm going to give a lot of deference to his choices, uh, but I'm also going to review each one carefully and make sure that they have uh, the temperament and the skills necessary to do a good job. I want to hear especially what their plans and vision is for each department, um, how they're going to help deliver on the promises that President Trump made on the campaign trail and that Republican senators said we would help them deliver on. But uh, obviously any senator uh, will give deference um, of some degree to a president of his own party. Uh, we by and large agree on those priorities in the Senate with President Trump, in contrast to Joe Biden's nominees, where we by and large disagreed with them. And we didn't want people carrying out his agenda at places like the Health and Human Services Department. So, Senator, do you need to see the ethics report from Matt Gates? Well, I think it's going to... Uh, in some in substance is going to become known one way or the other. I'm not sure what the House Ethics Committee will do later this week, but um, obviously uh, Mr. Gates will have to address those uh, in the hearing, whether or not it's been released publicly, whether it's been provided to senators, whether some uh, unscrupulous aide or congressman has leaked it out. I think in some in substance, uh, those will be addressed in the process. Learned over the years, Brian, is you can't necessarily always believe what you read in the liberal media. You shouldn't always, you shouldn't automatically discount it out of hand, but you should always examine the facts uh, fairly and make sure that you're not just jumping to conclusions um, based on what you read in the New York Times or see at CNN. Understood. Uh, Just going back to uh, Israel for a second, as they've gotten more and more into Lebanon, they're finding more and more Russian weapons. What's your reaction to that? We know Russia's role now, uh, arming the Houthi rebels. They're getting weapons to Hezbollah. Does this tell you something? Because they were also, for a while, 
kind of somewhat uh, friendly with Israel. What are we finding out about this dead country? Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. Um, Russia is up to no good around the world, and there's a growing um, you know, axis of adversaries that are maybe not co cooperating, collaborating. You know, Russia is relying on North Korean troops in Ukraine now. Russia is relying on Iranian missiles and drones. China imports large amounts of Iranian oil, so all of these collaborating even in the absence of a, a, any kind of formal alliance and we therefore shouldn't be surprised to find russian weapons in the hands uh, of iran's proxies putting pressure on the united states as allies so uh, and, uh with israel over the last uh, three months has been remarkable you know i think they the israeli government has decided to settle all the family business teams and they've done an incredible job of uh, devastating Hezbollah's rocket and missile forces and its leadership. That was the main deterrent, of course, against any kind of strike in Iran, a red line that Iran has already crossed twice now. So Iran, for the first time in decades, is totally exposed on its flanks. And, and I think Israel has a chance in the months ahead with President Trump uh, taking office again to fundamentally remake the security situation in the Middle East with the benefit of not only of Israel, but also our Arab allies in the United States. Senator, have you gotten briefed yet? Uh, like had a security briefing on Israel's strike against Iran? Because now they've confirmed as of yesterday, the prime minister did, that they took out parts of their nuclear program. Um, Brian, I'll simply say that I've seen those reports in the media and it sure does seem like something Israel would do. <laughs> well, it would be great. I mean, we should be actually doing it. It would make the whole region safer. Uh, and they, they look like they were targeting it. They said it was a limited strike, and the more you hear about it, the more effective it is. So, um, Senator, for, for what you see right now, um, for you personally, for this Senate, is there anything immigration-wise you could do immediately to support the president's quest to immediately secure the border and deport criminals? Is there anything you guys can yeah. do from the Senate? There is, Brian, uh, although first, I, I think... We should note for your listeners that Donald Trump can do a lot with pre-existing authorities on day one. He did that in 2019 and 2020 and largely closed the border. Things like the Remain in Mexico policy, for instance. I expect him to do that again uh, in the earliest days in office. But we have a bill next year that we expect to pass that will extend and enhance the Trump tax cuts from 2017. But it won't be just tax cuts either. Um, there'll be other measures in there related to fiscal policy, and I think some of those will be to help the president fulfill his promises at the border, help him build the wall to make sure that we have enough officers and agents both to protect our border and to conduct uh, interior enforcement to remove the illegal migrants, especially the criminals and those final orders of removal from the interior of the country. So there's a lot that we can do, uh, not necessarily on day one. The Congress doesn't work quite that fast, but in the early days of the Trump presidency to make sure that he has not just the legal authorities, uh, but the resources he needs in terms of uh, budget and manpower to close the border and begin to reverse the tidal wave of illegal migration of uh, the last four years. Only well, we got a minute left. What should Pete Haig says? Should he get the nomination confirmed? What should his focus be first? Well, Pete uh, has you know, served in the military for an entire career. Uh, he knows the troops well. He's written best-selling books about them. He is rightly focused on trying to get our troops refocused on fighting and winning wars. It's, the military is not designed for social engineering. It's not a jobs program. It's not a child care center. It's not a, a grocery uh, chain. It does all those things to support troops, but the core focus every single day has to be on fighting and winning wars. And that means the main thing that our troops at every level should be doing day in and day out is tough, realistic training to prepare them for war, hopefully so we can deter our enemies in the first place, not social engineering. Yeah, that'll be good, too. I'm catching you. The day he takes over, the day recruiting improves. Uh, Senator Tom Cotton, thanks so much. Always appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Senator Tom Cotton, putting the family first. All right. Uh,